So I don't know, Melissa, I think you can get started. Go for it. Let's do it. Go for it. We're five minutes in. We are so absolutely excited um, today. Um, we have a wonderful guest here with us that Bree's going to tell you a little bit more about um, in just a few. But I do want to start this episode with a very, very important um uh, message to you guys. This episode is going to have some very sensitive topics in it. Um, these Some of these topics could be triggering for people who have had experiences um, with body image um, in the past or currently. Um, so we do want you to make sure that you take every opportunity to protect your peace, um, protect your space. If you need to step out, please do so. Um, at any point, you can definitely come back into the discussion um, whenever you whenever you want, but we wanna make sure that everybody knows that, um, that everybody has this trigger warning, um, that we will be talking about body image, um, some of the experiences experiences that we have had in the past, um, some of the things that we can and, and can do in the future and may may not need to do in the future to make sure that uh, we are uh, protecting um, ourselves and making sure we have the most positive body image possible um, as we move forward in life. Um, so our question today, what are the do's and don'ts of commenting on a student's body? Um, all of us who have been in the dance world, we have probably all experienced this. If we haven't experienced it, we can definitely empathize with others that we have seen it happen to. Um, we uh, And we really want to take the time today um, to understand what's good, what's bad, what might you might think is good and is not quite as good as it as you think it is um and what the actual correct and most nurturing and loving and kind things um to say and do around body image for our students might be um so uh some of the things i want to lead with uh definitely of course been reading up on this topic um but a psychology today article written a while back a while back but i thought it was very interesting because it talked about body perceptions um, and feelings and how they govern so many things in our lives. It's not just when we look in the mirror, what we see, but it's who we meet, who we marry, the nature of our interactions, our day-to-day -day comfort levels, like our body image indicates and informs all of that. Um, and that's just from Psychology Today. That's one of the things Psychology Today lifted up in an article. Um, do something.org has some great information on the article that was um, five do's and don'ts. Um, of body image. And um, unfortunately, only 5%, this is this was stunning, y'all, 5% of women naturally possess the body type that's often portrayed in American media. 5%. So all of the images that were being fed, only 5% of the people actually naturally look that way. Which is crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> because is it makes, I mean, media makes you feel like that's the norm, right? Right. Yeah, it's like, and, but only 5% of the people actually naturally look that way. Um, and students, especially women, um, who consume a lot of mainstream media, a lot of movies, social media, um, television shows, they place greater importance on sexiness and your overall appearance than, don't, than those that don't consume a lot of mainstream media. Um, so we, as dance educators, who are often around children in their developmental stages, really need to be aware of kind of counter actions to what's happening out there already. So um, it's very important that we keep that in mind that we are probably the biggest impressions um, on students because we see them day to day just like their parents do um, and, their and their teachers in their, um, in their schools do. Um, so the purpose and intention of this conversation is to get you to understand the impact of the messages around body image. Understand the impact of what you say and how that lands on students because it's bigger than once they leave class. And we'll, we'll share some personal experiences later about how those things have definitely affected us. Um, give, give you some alternatives to what may have always been said. So there's things that have been passed down from da dance educator to dance educator over generations that, well, that's what my teacher said when she wanted me to do fill in the blank. Or what she said or what he said when I didn't, this costume was, you know, revealed. What we always said may not be what we need to be saying and doing now. Um, and to create an environment that really focuses on the beauty and the utility of the body versus feeling like you need a different body. So looking at the body you're in and saying, it's useful in this way, it's wonderful in this way, it's beautiful in this way, rather than saying, well, how can I make it beautiful or useful in another way? Um, so those are our intentions for today. Uh, it is so time for us to learn who Ashley is um, and how awesome she is and all the great information she's gonna bring us so brief. Please let people know all about Ashley. 
Yes, thank you, ma'am. This is so again, I'm Brie with Apollo. This is Melissa McDaniel. Um, and we are excited to wel welcome our guest panelists for this episode, Ashley Mowry, who is a performance mindset coach and an educator located in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She holds a BA in psychology from the University of Arkansas. She's a certified professional coach through Coach Training World, um, a certified and trained facilitator in Tara Moore's Playing Big Leadership Program for Women. Um, Ashley was a competitive dancer turned educator and a company director, now as a performance mindset coach. She is also a dance specialist with Doctors for Dancers, our good friends. Hi uh, to the Doctors for Dancers team. If, if, if you're looking for a dance specialist, you want to find them at doctorsfordancers.com. Um, Ashley has also been featured on several podcasts, including Dance Boss with Erin Pride, who we sponsor. Hi, Erin. If you're out there, check her out. Her podcast is amazing. Um, and she, uh, Ashley is also part of Apollo's blog team. Um, and yes, we have a blog team so it's called the muse um, by Apollo and it's we have a fantastic team of bloggers um, who give you a 360 degree view of the dancer and promote promote a happy healthy mind body and soul of dancers um, Ashley thank you so much for joining us and I know the topic today is deeply personal for you and you've put a lot of time and care into researching this um, so we appreciate you sharing your experience with us because I know this is something common that needs to be addressed in our dance community so badly, like Melissa said. So um, can you tell us, before we get started and dig into the, the hard questions, tell us a little bit about what you do as a performance mindset coach. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> as you said, I was a competition dancer. Um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, where it was very competitive, um, really large studio. And I struggled with um, body image perfectionism, um, being my own worst critic. But, you know, in those times, I just thought it was me. I thought, like, that's just how I was wired. Um, I didn't really have any, like, tools or resources to work through those things. Um, in college, when I was getting my degree in psychology, I started teaching dance at a local studio here in Fayetteville. And I started noticing these same things in my dancers, too, um, and started seeing it from the teacher's perspective. And I thought, you know, what are we doing here? Why are we not giving these dancers tools and resources to have a healthier mindset um, and be able to just have healthier mental well-being um, as dancers? And so I um, went through a lot of certifications and trainings, um, and now I coach full-time. So the majority of my business is one-on-one -on -one coaching with dancers from preteens to professionals. Um, I also work really closely for um, kiddos under 18. I work really closely with their parents throughout the coaching process. So um, really That's open dialogue. Really great. That's great. Yeah, really open dialogues about like the tools that we're using, um, the exercises that we're practicing. Um, and then I also work with dance teachers on both mindset tools for them and how they can use them. And then also um, what they can do to help the mindsets of their students. Thank you so much for that. And we have a couple comments in the chat. Elizabeth says, yes, dance and dance education often get stuck in tradition. And that is so true because, and, and don't you guys think too, as artists, we evolve so much. And we always say this mm -hmm. for Apollo, but on the, the dance, the structural side of things, we get a little bit stuck and we're like, come on, let's move it along a little bit. So um, that's one of the things that's our mission with Apollo. And I know that we're gonna talk a lot about in this series. Um, Casey says, I feel like everyone feels alone as a team Team is that a normal mindset for teens I know I felt the same and, and I can raise my hand and agree with that as well what do you say to that Ashley yeah I do I think throughout this work um, it's been so interesting to so it went you know from like me feeling it and then me seeing it in my students and then now I work with students all across the United States um, and it's all so similar like it's all these mindsets that we have as dancers are all um, so similar. I would say the biggest things that pretty much all of my clients share are um, really loud negative inner critics, um, body image, a lot of fears. So fears um, surrounding performance or fears of like putting themselves out there or taking risks or going to the front of the class, um, fear of failure. Um, and then also getting wrapped up in that competition mindset, even if you're not in a competition team, um, but just the competitive nature that dance can put us in, um, you know, when there's only one lead role and um, there's only one first place overall. And so those are the main areas. And I do think 
I think it's a, it is a really nor, normal mindset for dancers to have, but I want to do something to help them have the tools so that they can have healthier mindsets and then um, prolong their dance careers. I see what I see a lot of times is that this leads to burnout in dancers. And that was something yeah. that I was really passionate about, like both with myself. I from a really young age, I wanted to go to college for dance. And then by my senior year, I was so, I was like, I'm done with this world. Like it's hard. It's and it, not just that it's hard, but I felt just um, like I was losing myself and that I just it was um, it just didn't feel healthy. And so I want to help other dancers, um, you know, elongate their careers mm -hmm. in whatever way that, that like. and it's so much needed and how much does uh, how much of a role does social media also play on that pressure that they feel in comparing their their bodies and their you know where they're at just comparison in general um to what they're seeing flash across their screen every two seconds you know how, how much does that play a part oh i think it plays a huge part um you know back in my day we only had um like this was when like Hall of Fame competition had just yeah. started like posting their videos. And that's like all we had to look and compare at like dancers, you know, on the internet around them, and YouTube. Um, but now it is. And that's a big thing that I work on with my um, clients too. Like we often talk um, with my clients and with parents about like social media detox, like we're going through their followers and like anybody who is not, anybody who is bringing out those insecurities or that comparison, um, and just really like either muting them or unfollowing them um, and making sure that they are seeing images and videos that um, promote a healthy mindset. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna get we're gonna dive in now. Um, it, but for those watching live on Facebook, live on Instagram, hi, um, you're gonna see us turning all kinds of ways. It's not we're not ignoring. We are uh, monitoring the chat on Facebook. I have a monitor over here. So does Melissa. And then we have our phones live on Instagram to shoo everybody over to Facebook Live and also uh, register to get the Zoom link by clicking the link in our bio. So again, lots to monitor. We're trying to make this as accessible and open for everyone to participate so we reach as far as we can um, our industry needs this we need to come together and we need to start making some pretty big changes I think it's time um, I know I'm not the only one that feels that way so um, please put we, we don't want to talk at you. That's not why we're here. We're on this journey with you. So we want to hear your thoughts, your feelings, your perspectives, even if they're different than the ones that we're saying right now. Um, put them in the chat, put them in the comments, ask questions. We're going to stop and drop everything we're doing to make sure that we answer your questions throughout these conversations. Um, so again, we're just asking that you keep it respectful. Um, so again, we're going to be monitoring the chat. We want to hear from you. So um, you know, again, let's, let's get started. Yep, absolutely. I have a burning question. I definitely want to get started with, uh, because I know it's something that has definitely affected my life. And I know a lot of us are choosing costumes right now, um, for recital and competition. So this is going to be big. I do want to remind anyone who has just joined the, the zoom or just joined, um, just joined us on Facebook Live or even Instagram Live, uh, just giving a, a trigger warning that we will be talking about uh, body image. Uh, there may be some uh, some content that even maybe even leads to maybe eating disorders. Um, so if that is something that is a trigger for you, uh, please take the time to protect your space. Please take the time to protect your energy. You're welcome to step out of the conversation. You can definitely come back in using the same link at any time. Um, so please take that, take that space for yourself if you need it. And Melissa, before you ask your burning question, I just want to make sure to interject what Stephanie Sloop just said on Zoom. TikTok is now becoming a problem with body image. Parents are not aware that this is happening here. Everyone thinks of Instagram and Facebook. And Stephanie, you are absolutely right. I'm, I am not an active uh, TikTok participator, but I have seen content and I'm kind of horrified by some of the things I have a four and a seven year old. Um, and you know, my husband and I are frequently having those conversations about what if ever they're going, you know, if ever they're going to have an account um, and that we're, we're on the no side uh, right now. Uh, so definitely agree with you there. Right. So costumes. So we have all done it. Um, we got a lot of dance educators in the room, lots of them on Facebook Live. We have this vision, we have a song, we have choreography, and we have this vision for a costume. Whatever it is, that's what we see. We can't, we, we think about it, we're sleeping, we're dreaming about it. Um, and we have a desire for a certain look and we go full, full stream ahead uh, to make that happen. 
what considerations do we as teachers, Ashley, need to take as we make costuming decisions when it comes yeah. to the image? Yeah, Melissa, that's a great question. Um, so <clears throat> I would say first and foremost, the I think the biggest consideration we need to be making regarding costumes and body image as a whole um, is that our students are humans first and dancers second. Um, and like you were saying earlier, Melissa, really fostering um, those, our relationship with them, but also fostering them as humans. Um, and so, and nurturing, you know, them as humans. And so um, I think that, you know, it's, I think one of the biggest values that we can bring into the studio is to create a culture where students know that their worth and their value is not dependent on their body size and on their shape and on their weight. And I think that's the first thing that we have to do is get really clear on that, talk about that, be open about that, have conversations about that, model that. That's through how you talk about your own body. That's how you talk about other people's bodies. That's how you talk about dancers at other studios bodies, you know, um, social media, that's, it's just how we talk about bodies and that it's not, um, they're not getting the message that that is um, tied into their self worth. So I would say that's number one. Um, also, I would say this principle, like you were talking about earlier, Melissa, um, one of my very favorite quotes from a nonprofit called Beauty Redefined, who um, they are experts on body image resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a great resource for you guys to follow. Um, I, they're so much, they do so much research and advocacy in this area. Um, but one of my favorite quotes from them is, loving your body isn't believing your body looks good, it's knowing that it is good. Um, regardless of how it looks. It isn't thinking you are beautiful. It's knowing you are more than beautiful. It's understanding that your body is an instrument for your use and not an ornament mm -hmm. to be admired. So I think that's going, you know, back to that idea that our bodies are instruments, especially as dancers. Like that's our tool. Um, that's our instrument for that. And so, um, I think going into costume picking, knowing that, knowing that the body is an instrument. Um, and then as an extension of that, I would say that costumes are also an, an instrument. Um, they're an instrument for your story. They're an instrument for your choreography. They're an instrument to showcase your dancer's technique. Um, so looking from that perspective and then also looking at what is going to make my dancers feel most confident and comfortable. And now you're gonna have dancers of all shapes and all sizes that feel really great and really not great. Like, you know, it's not, size doesn't determine, you know, somebody's self-consciousness in a costume. But you as their dance teacher have to be tapped into how they're feeling and what is going to make them feel their best. And I think that there's a way to do that, you know, designing. Yeah. yeah, but it's interesting too that why wouldn't a, a studio director, when you think about it that way, wouldn't you want all your students to be on stage at their most comfortable so that they're not worrying and, and you know, they're just not feeling terrible while they're up there. They can give their best and focus on the performance and the technique and everything they have to put forth mm -hmm. for a performance rather mm -hmm. than being just totally self-conscious in this piece of cloth that, you know, for the most part gets a 10 out of 10 anyway, when you're, you know what I mean? Right. When you're at competition. I mean, let's be honest. They're like not taking points off costumes unless it's like abysmally inappropriate. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's just the way things go right now. And hopefully that changes. Hopefully they come down on people that are in these, you know, inappropriate costumes for, for the age of the kids that are on stage. But the reality is, is that they're not taking points off for costumes regardless. So why are you going to put this importance on this costume that doesn't make somebody feel good? Right. Yeah. Good, how, Melissa, how, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and well, Ashley, how, and to, to Bree's point, because uh, when we talk about competition, of course, there is a competition. There's a, a score that goes mm -hmm. into it. It's usually about 10 points out of your 100 um, that you're giving, although I've seen up to 15 before. Um, but um, how, how does uniformity in costuming play into this? Because I think that a lot of this, when we're talking about, oh, you do what, the, what makes the dancer feel comfortable and what makes them feel good, when we think about it from a teacher's perspective, I think about, well, all 10 of them are supposed to look the same. 
everybody has have on the bra top and the shorts and the you get into this mindset well i have to pick something that everybody looks the same in is that still a thing is that some i mean and and not to, it's not the same but just to liken it to something now everybody's doing these bridesmaids dresses when they get married where everybody gets to choose their own style because nobody wants anybody to buy a bridesmaids dress that they're never going to wear again or that they look yeah. the, so yeah. that shift has been made. Is that a shift that needs to be made in dance? You know, what are your thoughts on that? That's a really, that's a great question. And a great thing for us to all think of, I think, um, as dance educators, and I would be super interested to see if that does become more of a trend. I'm, I, th I think there's a way to have unity. Um, I think what we need to challenge, and, and I'm saying we, me too, um, is that unity also implies the same body type. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that we as a dance um, industry have a lot of work to do is that like dancers of body types, different body types might not all look the exact same in every costume, but I think they can all look flattering and appropriate and comfortable and confident. And so I think we have to start shifting our mind um, to think that like it's bad that different or bigger bodies are going to look less uniform um, than, you know, the stereotypical like thin dancer body. Um, I think that's some challenge work that we could do within ourselves. Yes. I love that Michelle talked about uniformity uh, without losing individual safety in the chat here in Zoom. Like, how do we how do we achieve uniformity without losing individual safety? Yeah, she gives a great analogy. I picture the gears in a clock. All the gears are different shapes and sizes, but they are all swirling together beautifully to make something work. That is a fantastic yeah. visual. That's yeah. beautiful. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And then we have on Facebook, um, I feel it's the studio's responsibility to be inclusive of all body types in the class. Yes, because if I mean, they're there to learn there. This is not, you know, this is not a professional show. This is not, um, you know, and I know we get caught up in that. I'm guilty of that. I am guilty of that as well. Like, you know, in my time as a director and an educator, like the vision is this, <laughs> you know, like you get so passionate about the work you're putting in there as the creator and the educator that you get swept up in it. And the reality is, is that they are not going out and getting paid for this job. They're actually paying you. Um, they're coming to you to teach their child and you're part of that village. So, you know, it really is, I think, it, your role to take that responsibility, you know, that responsibility on. Um, and then Vanessa says um, she's lucky to be at a studio that that considers, you know, appropriate music and costuming. Um, and she's very happy there. Um, she said, and of course, choosing costuming, making all disabilities feel comfortable while still working with their bodies is also really important, which is a great point. Right. Um, so yeah, lots of great feedback here. Um, you know, one thing I, I and, and to kind of uh, piggyback onto Vanessa's comment, you know, I want to make sure that we're addressing the body thing because a lot of times when we talk about this topic, it's are we too heavy? Are we too thin? And it's the focus on that. But you know, when I was young, I was very chesty, and um, it, it was it was horrifying. You know, in dance, all everything is very body conscious, and um, you know, I'm going there, and and I was raised to be very confident in myself, and I'm going to dance where I'm in these, you know, leotards, and you know, and I didn't want to take my pants off for ballet. I didn't, I, I wanted to be in my sweatpants under my ballet skirt because I hated my, my bottom half. And I didn't want to take my t-shirt off because I didn't want anybody to see my chest. And I'm talking about, I'm little, you know, 10, 11 years old and went home crying every day because I was being made fun of and nobody was doing anything. And I think let's talk about too, you know, what is the responsibility? You know, if you're seeing that, if you're hearing that, um, you know, is that damaging? So I, I think for me, I'm not realizing until I started really going on this journey of evolution and, and realizing the how far reaching words and actions are or aren't, you know, if you do or do don't take action, um, I'm realizing the impact that's had on me through my whole life. And um, 
you know, what the part that's played in the choices that I've made, the way that I feel about myself. Um, but again, as a young girl, that was just debilitating for me. Um, and we had to deal with that a lot in our house. And my parents had a big handful to deal with, you know, they're, they're, you know, 10, 11, 12 year old coming home in a pile of tears saying, I don't want to go back to school. I don't want to go back to dance because they're so mean. Um, so, you know, it, it's not just about weight. It's, it's about all of it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ashley, what are some of the things that we say that we think are well-meaning? I know you have a particular specific story that I've read about in this area. We say things that we think are accommodating or well-meaning. Um, and sometimes it actually has the reverse effect on some students. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think we do have this misconception as a society as a whole, um, and then definitely in the dance industry that like complimenting somebody's body or weight loss um, is always a good thing. And there is so much research um, in the last few years that is showing that that is absolutely not the case. Um, and that it's actually really damaging, um, especially to our teens and younger kiddos. Um, again, it's putting that emphasis that their worth is um, entangled with their body size and shape and different body parts. Um, I write about it in, you know, the blog for Apollo for October, um, my experience. But yeah, when I was 17, I was losing a lot of weight. I wasn't doing it in a healthy way. Um, I was restrictive eating. Um, and in front of a huge company rehearsal, um, many company up, up to senior company, um, my dance teacher stopped everyone and praised me. Everybody, look at Ashley O, look how skinny she looks, look how amazing her body looks in this costume. It was a teeny, teeny, tiny little bra and briefs. Um, and I, that just in the moment, it was like, oh, I got praised, I got recognized as she approves of me. You know, I think we're so, um, we seek that approval from our dance teachers so much. Um, and at 17, that was really confusing. And I think even for the little kids in that room, I think that sends the message that, oh, weight loss is something to be sought after. And weight loss is the goal here. And that thin is better. And look, Ashley O is getting all this praise because of her weight loss and because of how her body looks in this teeny tiny costume. So um, there is, that's my been my experience. Um, there's also been a lot of research that um, dancers who experience thinness related learning. So that's learning about that's um, being in an environment in a dance studio or dance classes where there is talk about the benefits of thinness, talk about diets, talk about eating, talk about restrictive eating, talk about cutting out f different food groups, talk about um, bodies in, you know, a negative way or in a shaming way um, that they have done research that shows that learning in those environments is a predictor and it correlates to um, symptoms of eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And so it is something that's really serious um, and can definitely um, lead to eating disorders and um, just a lifelong, you know, struggle with body image and a lot of confusion for kids and teens. So there's a lot of um, comments that I want to make sure we get to in the chat. Um, the ballet world needs a lot of work on this. Most companies have core that really do, do look all the same, so they don't have to worry about costumes looking different on different people. They don't hire diversity, which that's a that's another day. Right. Mm -hmm. that problem. And dance students see that and see that they don't belong in that world. Our professional dance organizations affect our students too. Absolutely. Yeah, completely. Absolutely. Talk about role models. Um, you know, that that's young kid. That's what, how they know that I want to grow up and do this. I want to be that. I want to look at, I want to look like that. I want to do that. So um, what message are we sending them that way? Um, another one, if you have a whole group of one body type, you can only create a finite amount of shapes and pictures. If you put strong bodies with flexible bodies, with big bodies and small bodies, we can build more. Right. Fantastic. Um, do more possible that way. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it's this tradition and thinking. So how do we, it really does start with the educators, the teachers, the studio owners. How do we evolve that mindset? Is it through, you know, programs like YPAD that need to get pushed out further, the YPAD certification, what, how, how do we start? Because again, the problem is we're rooted in this tradition of 
you know, I learned this way and I'm fine. I'm here, you know, and so I'm just going to do what I was taught. And it, it's just breeding this cycle of repetition over and over and over. So what is the answer to that? You know? Yeah. I, I want to point this out really quickly because uh, I don't want it to pass without us addressing it. Um, I think we need to put a little bug in the ear of costuming company. Um, because I think that that is when our options are limited, uh, when they are cut and designed uh, for Eurocentric body standards, thank you for that terminology, Elizabeth, um, it makes the options very limited. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna be really honest, most booty shorts don't look good on anybody's bottom. <laughs> if you have any type of bottom, there's some leakage and slippage that is happening out of the bottom of those shorts. Why are they being cut like that? Uh, same thing with bra tops. Why are they being cut like that? Uh, why are we only being offered in a catalog of 50 costumes, 48.5 of them are two pieces, and one is a one piece that has layers and layers of ruffles and material and feathers and, and all types of sticks and circles. And I mean, we need to be as cost and people who have their costumes made, um, which is extremely expensive. Um, and people who uh, are trying to choose from these costume catalogs, we really need to make sure we're calling out as studio owners and dance educators and making it clear, hey, we want more uh, diverse offerings um, in these catalogs that are, um, are complementary of many body types. So we're saying that, right? We're saying that. I mean, I'm hearing that a lot. We need to talk to competitions and conventions and, you know, about who they're hiring and who's teaching and, um, you know, what the hours that they have these kids dancing and what they're, you know, putting, placing importance on, on these weekends. But, and we're talking about costume companies and it's all great that we're talking about it, but how, what are we going to do about it? And so what is the, is that, that's a lot of these costume companies, they're calling every year. You know, I used to get calls from all the, are you going to place an order? That is the time when you go look, because the, the only thing that's going to speak is the dollar. I mean, let's be real, right? When when these organizations are not making money, they're not making money hand over fist, they're going to sit up and pay attention and go, I need to make a change or I'm going to lose my business. So how do we do that? You have to talk to your rep. You have to send emails. You have to not purchase costumes and put them together yourself or get them custom made or whatever it is. Um, and I know that custom isn't an option for everybody because of money. And I get that. But then go somewhere else because or, you know, get all of it together retail and, and you know, or alter your vision a little bit on what this costume is going to be. But, you know, if we don't do that, it's going to stay the same, right? So everybody, maybe let's start, let's start talking and start emailing the reps and talking to them and um, having those hard conversations. Cause, and two, like I know as a studio director and an educator, we get stuck in like, our pattern of behavior is this all year long. This month I have to get this done and this month, it, because our plates are so full and so overloaded that we don't have time for anything else. So to ask me to change the, my system, you know, that's so efficient for me that I've got down, I can do it with my eyes closed, my hands tied behind my back. That's asking me a lot, especially during costume, you know, co competition and convention season and costuming and all of those things. So it's gonna take us going, I've got to spend a little time on this too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, we um, talk about costuming forever and ever and ever. Yeah, we really could. We yeah. really could. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but lots of lots of great feedback, and again, um, you know, make it, talking about any child's weight is, is a no no go. I mean, r wouldn't that be the rule, right, Ashley? Like, yes. Yeah, just don't. Absolutely. I think don't don't talk about it. You're not um, you're not a doctor. You're not a dietitian. You're not a um, nutritionist you don't have any certifications in this um and i think that it does so much more harm than good yeah thank you for that so uh, one of the biggest misconceptions and you started talking about this is that words aren't damaging if you're not directly referencing a student's body or eating habits negatively right mm -hmm. like you're not harping on them but you're, it can be equally damaging and have an adverse reaction when you're delivering seemingly positive feedback and praise as well. And you've just shared, you know, your experience with that. Um, so comment on that a little bit for everyone watching. And, and for those that think, well, I didn't say anything bad. I was saying that they looked great. Well, yeah. what message is that sending? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's sending the message. Um, it's reinforcing this idea that thin is better and that there is a certain body type that should be achieved by every dancer. Um, and it's also sending the message that that's how you get praise and approval from your dance teachers and your mentors. Um, and so if somebody, um, and it also is like as dance educators, I think we probably, um, have some clues into if they are doing this in a healthy way, but sometimes we might not know if they are um, losing weight in a healthy way. And so I think it's just, um, it's better to err on the side of complimenting them for their work and for their effort and not for their body. So, wow, you're working so hard. Um, I can tell you have so much energy and you really fueled your body today. to have great stamina throughout class or, um, oh, your jumps are getting, you know, so high. That looks amazing. You know, different compliments that are not about their weight or their bodies, but about the effort and hard work that they are. Let me ask you, is it okay? Because I did, I will say I did this and I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if it's right or not, but my take, my, my, I was very hard about this on my, my staff, my teachers. I don't want to talk about calories. I don't want to talk about nutrition. But it's hard too when you look at kids that are, you know, they're about to go on stage and they've got a bag of Cheetos. You know what I mean? And that's that's yes. not that's not good. And so yes. my thing was always we can talk about nutrition when it comes to fueling their body properly as athletes to get through the rigorous schedule that they're keeping, not only just at the studio, but also with school, making sure they're eating the right foods to fuel their body to sustain the schedule that they have, which was often very, very overloaded and jam packed. So, mm-hmm. you know, is that an okay conversation to have? Or is that kind of walking the line? I think it is completely okay if you go from the place that it sounds like you went. Um, I think it should never come to the place of your body, like not from a place of like your body's not going to look good if you eat that or like this is because you need to lose weight or you know those kinds of things Um, if we are talking about fueling the body and they need energy and they have these huge schedules um, I think that's completely appropriate and I think also Brie this is a great time um, that I think right now where we are um, in the dance community is we have so much access to experts um both through apala and your blog the muse um doctors for dancers and i think that um you know number one sometimes dancers listen more when it comes from another expert than their teacher um but i do think there are some really amazing um, nutritionists for dancers and registered dietitians for dancers eating disorder specialists for dancers that create amazing content on instagram um three of my favorites that i'll say real quick are uh, monica seigel um, Kristen Koskinen and Rachel Fine and they are they post all the time about like um, both the mindset of eating of like allowing yourself to have the freedom to eat what you want and to not be restrictive but also um, about foods that fuel the dancer's body and um, and nutrition to perform at your best so I definitely think it's an appropriate conversation um, but I also think you could follow it up with and here are some experts that post about this a lot um, and I and have great websites and great resources too I love it because I think providing resources especially for parents hi uh, speaking of Kristen is on hi or watching hi hi Kristen Join Yay, us on hey. Facebook live <laughs> so you can contribute because I know you have a lot to contribute Dr. Kristen um so anyway yeah there's uh, some great comments here uh, just want to touch on those um <laughs> I went through I went through it and turned out fine I always worry about the dance educators that say that yes oh my gosh I did it yeah. You said this to me. You think that was bad. Never a good sign. Red flag. I feel with kids, especially, it's always way more helpful to come from and add more foods than you can't have that because mm-hmm. also at competition, it's stressful. I needed that sugar kick and the sandwich later. Um, so, yeah, that, that those are great points. I added um, their names, Dr. Kristen Kosnikin and Monica Seigel. Um, there you guys can look them up on Instagram. Um, but, yeah, intuitive eating. Um, right. You know, good and to point. stay – to say that I say, but did we really turn out? Right? Like, yeah. yeah, we definitely we all have issues, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that and what the the question I have now, and I I pose this to um, Casey when we talk all the time is, 
the, the problem that we're seeing right now is everybody thinks they're fine until like 10, 15, 20 years later. And then we realize we're not fine. We've got these enormous, massive issues that have affected who we have become in life and what we've done and the insecurities that we deal with and shoulder every single day. And we're not fine. So uh, it is important that we recognize this and start doing something about it and talking to these costume companies because because in 20 years, we don't want to see these kids shouldering those issues, you know? Um, so, so yeah, it's, we have so much rolling around in our heads in life that can impact us on an intimate level that we face. Yes, Casey, absolutely. Um, so again, an experience I had, and I want to, I want to ask you about this. Some studio directors teach most of their own classes. Some teach a little, some stay behind the desk and rely on, uh, you know, a full faculty to run the classrooms for them. And they do the admin, what can a studio owner or director do to make sure all the teachers in that studio under that studio umbrella because a lot of times these teachers are independent contractors they teach all over the place they're not your employee they are an independent contractor how can they you make sure that they are on the same page as you and aware of the importance of their words and the feedback in promoting a healthy body image um, and that because the studio is ultimately liable for the fallout from that. So talk a little bit about how you can make your faculty understand the importance of this even if they're not technically your employee. Yeah, that's such a great topic. Um, so I would say I think, you know, no matter what your um, day-to-day duties in your studio are, I think that it all does start from you and from your beliefs and from the culture that you create. So going back to like how you talk about your own body, how you talk about other bodies, um, that's where it starts. Um, I also think, you know, again, I think COVID has shown us um, that w- online workshops and trainings are so much more accessible than I think we ever thought. Um, I know we're probably all so sick of them by now, um, but I think, you know, it's these experts are so accessible. And so I think um, completely it is, um, I would suggest setting up like a day training with get a um, registered dietitian who works with dancers and eating disorder specialist a mindset coach, you know, whatever um, it is and make a day zoom training for your teachers, even your independent contractors, you you might have to pay them for the hours that they're there. Um, But if this is something, you know, that you're really passionate about, um, that might be something to consider. Um, And have them, you know, learn this, show them this training um, and go through a training with them. And then I think from there, I really think it's important um, to create a policy regarding these issues at your studio. So um, once you go through the training, sit down as a group um, and create like, what is your, what are your team values and um, culture that you want to create? How do you want the kids in your studio to feel about them, their bodies and themselves? And what is the policy for teachers and how can they uphold that? and then from there have ongoing conversations you know this is um toxic diet culture is so seeped into like all of us that it's this isn't going to be like a next day thing like i even i do this like as a living and i still catch myself like daily like thinking some toxic diet culture like thought about myself or about other people and so this is going to take some time this is going to take some really compassionate empathetic conversations with your team um but holding them accountable um and also being picky about who you hire and who you fire like if um i think be really compassionate have several conversations but if there is somebody on your team even if they're a famous choreographer even if they're um somebody really well known in the industry even if they're your best teacher if they are bringing this toxicity and you know like we've talked about like we all are like well i'm fine now but i'm really not go you have the chance now to break the cycle and i think you know that has some hard decisions that come with it um but being really mindful of the presence of the teachers and what they are doing in your studio 
And right, because if you're not in there, you have to really listen to the parents. Um, and that was, you know, the uh, the other thing is is having parents and kids come to you. Yeah, if you didn't hear what was said. You only know how they interpreted it. And so, and that's, you know, I, I, that was hard for me. That was really hard for me because I was a teacher that really wanted uh, a studio director that really wanted to. Um, my teachers to know that I had their back and for them to have <laughs> mine. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you're hearing things once, twice, three times that that's coming from somewhere. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, you have to have some really hard, you have to make sure you're in encouraging your parents and your students that they can come to you anytime with yes, concerns yes. and that they're safe to do that. Um, and also let your teachers know where you stand and this is zero tolerance policy. I think this is something yeah, that's yeah. definitely worthy of a zero tolerance title don't you yeah uh, completely yes i do um yeah. we had a great comment from elizabeth which is just really a reminder kids soak up everything yeah. um, they don't just soak up words they soak up actions they see what we're doing um they see what we're rewarding what we're not rewarding uh, i am so guilty and my students and the people who are in this chat my uh, fellow teachers at the studio that i'm at right now will uh, will attest I walk in with a Starbucks cup every single class um, to the point where one day for spirit week we did a dress up like your teacher and all the kids brought Starbucks cups because I have a Starbucks cup and a scarf yes Stephanie is laughing because that's true I wish I had the picture right now with me but they all had a scarf on and a Starbucks cup um, because that that's what now I don't walk in with any fruit or any sna healthy snacks I walk in with a Starbucks cup like I have to think oh my gosh <laughs> like what am I what am I saying um to them uh when I walk in with the Starbucks cup to caffeinate myself yeah, but not live on Facebook and on Zoom to fuel myself to um to um to fuel myself. So we gotta make sure that we are doing that um regularly. Um trying to make sure that we are getting all these comments um and there's just such lively conversation in here. We're so we're so uh, super excited about that. Um Keep the questions and comments coming on Facebook Live, on Instagram Live, on Zoom. Everybody just keep them coming as much as you possibly can. Uh, and we're going to, um, just to give everybody a little um, update, we are going to talk about nutrition like later in this series. Like actually what are some healthy snacks and what are some, what is some body fuel um, that we can use um, to make sure that we are giving our bodies exactly what they need. Um, I want to roll into, um, if it's okay with Brie, um, one is near and dear to my heart. So yes. your body structure, like I'm just built like this. What does that mean? Um, yeah. Like, what does that mean? Is there, is there actually a such thing as a body type? Um, and just, you know, along the same vein of sharing and being extremely transparent, I have always been an extremely hippie dancer. Very full figure, <laughs> too. Very full figured, uh, very full hips, and that was y'all know that is not the ballet way. Um, no costume ever. Traditional fit. ballet way. It can be the ballet, ballet way. way. Yes, not the traditional ballet way. Um, but no costume ever fit me the same as anyone else. Um, even costumes that were supposed to be full coverage were never full coverage on me because they are not cut that way. Um, and specifically the story that I, I share um, often is my, my senior year, my senior solo, it was a lyrical piece and my choreographer, um, you know, kept commenting that I need to lose weight. I need to lose weight in my hips and I need to slim down in my hips and my thighs. Um, mm -hmm. And by the time it was co time to choose costumes and competition season, he said, I'm putting you in a black dress, black tights and black shoes just so I can trim you down on stage. And I have oh. to wear black from head to toe, head to toe, um, all because it looked like I was going, I was in mourning. I remember I did get, I did a comment like, it looks like you're in mourning. I'm not sure if the costume fits the, fits the piece. It's a song about love. It was I Believe in You and Me by Whitney Houston. Um, and it was, it was, and he, he was very clear that this is because I need to slim your legs down uh, on stage. Um, and, you know, that definitely sticks with you. Um, how, that's how you are built. Um, so is there such a thing, Ashley, as a genetic body type? Um, what does that mean? Like, how, what does that mean for people? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and thank you, Melissa, for sharing that. Um, I know, like, I totally empathize with the, those feelings. Um, and I think that that just is so important to share and to normalize that we've had these experiences, but then also, like, why we're having this conversation. Um, genetic body types. Okay, so there is a genetics definitely play a big role in our bodies. Um, however, there's a ton of contributing factors. I mean, like, there's so many, we don't know what our dancers are, um, what their families can afford for dinner at night. We don't know um, what they can have for school lunches. We don't know, um, and that's just like eating habits, but then also just like their um, movement outside of dance. And, you know, there's so many different contributing factors. Um, I do think that definitely people are built differently. Uh, people are built with bigger hips and bigger breasts and bigger thighs. Um, and I remember growing up um, always like kidding, but it's like really sad now to think about, but I always kidding that like I got my dad's big thighs and my mom's, you know, rounder stomach and that I got like the worst parts of both of them, <laughs> which is so like, I mean, I remember thinking this for like such a young age, like, Man, I really got, like, my brother got these, like, thin, nice legs. Um, I did not. I had my dad's athletic thighs. Um, and so there definitely are um, certain things that we are just going to have. And I think part of this for all of us is to normalize different sizes and different body parts that are bigger, wider. Um, and that's not bad. That's not, you know, um, some of the most athletic, strong dancers have bigger butts and bigger thighs and bigger hips and you know and so i think um it's our job to start normalizing that i think um some ways that we can do that is just like taking a look at um like the pictures in our studio are they representative of diverse bodies or are they all you know very thin dancers mm -hmm. um the pictures on our social media are we only sharing the pictures of you know, the skinnier dancers, or um, are we also sharing, you know, bigger bodies? Um, and so I think we start there. Um, and I also think as educators, we just have to know that it's not, yeah, it's not appropriate and it's damaging to comment on, I, I said um, in my blog post, our, my teacher used to always comment about our problematic areas, you know, whatever that was. Each of us had different ones. Um, you, have, you can't have a problematic area when you're 13. Like, my uh, God, you know, like, you can't do, you know, they don't even know what problematic areas are at right. that, no. you know what I mean? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, I completely agree. And then it puts it puts into your brain that like there is something wrong with my thighs. There is something wrong with my stomach. There is something wrong with my breasts. And that is um, that's so damaging and has such lifelong effects. And so I think, um, you know, really showing how you support and celebrate um, different body types and different body shapes and then also not commenting on dancers um, that have bigger sizes and different bigger areas. anything bigger anything, anything. or no, different no, anything no. I mean just normalizing it being okay with it and also when they make comments you know like um I know that that happens a lot and not so you don't want to ever shame um a student for like oh don't say that about yourself you know I know I've been so guilty of that um because you you hear it and you're like oh don't don't say that I don't that's not you know that's not true um you want to meet it with empathy and say hey I hear you um, I have felt like that too, but your thighs are beautiful. They are strong and they are completely welcome here, you know, and really, um, having those conversations that all shapes, all sizes, all body parts are welcome in your studio. So never dismissing their feelings. If they're voicing, yes. that I feel this way about my body, but re acknowledging them, giving empathy and then reinforcing that they're beautiful as they are and that yeah. there's nothing wrong or broken about them. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. What, um, do, you, yeah, oh, ahead, ahead. what do you do if a student, because I know I, I did at one point to that same exact choreographer go and say, okay, I really, we were actually going into a bodysuit. I'll never forget. It was a velvet blue cat suit. 
uh, <laughs> which now would have been in, um, but it was a velvet blue cat suit. Uh, and I was like, I don't want my butt to look so big on stage. Um, you know, I'm going to look bigger than everybody else. And I went to him and he was like, okay, so at the beginning of every private, we're going to do leg lifts. And, and he, he, he went through an exercise routine to help me I guess, firm up or slim down. What do you say when a student comes to you and wants to actually, they feel like they have identified a problematic area and they want your help? That's a really great question. Um, I would say, again, this is a great time to like outsource to experts. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there are, um, I know there's a lot of different like dance scientists, um, like we talked about earlier, nutritionists, dietitians that work with dancers, um, and they are going to have the training and um, the ability to talk with dancers about those areas that they want to fix. Um, and I think as a dance educator, you can come from the part of like normalizing their feelings, um, making them feel like it's not wrong, um, it's okay, and it's also okay to want a slimmer butt if that's what you know what i mean like that that is okay like um but it is if we get into a problematic area when that becomes the focus and so normalizing it for that um and working if you have um like any trainers um like athletic trainers that work with dancers or you can resource outsource to those um and but making it that they are overall healthy and overall strong and not just i want to lose my butt or is it you know, good to ask a child me. like when a child comes to you and says you know i want to do this for myself is it good to ask why they're asking you that like can you, yes. you say, where is this coming from why yes. do you want to, why why do you yes. want to do this absolutely i think that is such a great um important thing to ask Bree. thank you for that and i think absolutely i think you know i think oftentimes you might hear like oh you know, Sally said, my, I have a big butt. And so I really want to work on that. Or, oh, she made feather my thighs or whatever. And I think that that's such a great point of like, where is this coming from? What is this? Um, and then also being really delicate in like, it is okay to want to be as strong and as athletic as we can be and not making it about weight um, and also being really delicate to not make sure that they know that it's not about their value as a dancer too. Yeah, thank you so much for all of the insight. Um, uh, Melissa, I, I think we, it's time to get into our, our actionable item for the yeah. week, which we already talked so about. Great questions. I yeah. see we're, gonna, we're gonna pin these and put yes. them back. One great one that I do wanna lift up that we're definitely gonna talk about, what about teachers who have eating disorders and issues from growing up in studios. So I want to pin that as a future, a future episode, like really healing yourself as a teacher so that you can better serve your students. So put a pin in that. You will hear about that later in a Beyond the Steps because that's Thank big. You, Thank you. Thank you, Casey, for that one. Uh, yeah, actionable steps, actionable steps. What do we do? So uh, this is Beyond the Steps and we want to go beyond the steps. So we always try to leave you with some type of action item. What do we want you to do between now and next week or now and two weeks from now? What do we want you to do, period? Um, so uh, Ashley has uh, so graciously provided an activity and exercise um, to help you uh, really work through um, uh, what you need to do to make sure that there's a positive body image culture in your studio. Uh, Bree is going to drop that link for that activity in the chat uh, on Facebook Live as well as um, on Zoom. But Asha, do you want to talk about this activity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have an example here and you guys will get that. I don't know how you can see that, but it's a PDF that I created. Um, it has six reflection questions. Um, and so I, I say at the top of this that I invite you to answer these questions with an open heart and grounded mind. Um, this is tough stuff, you guys. It's hard to talk about. It's hard to reflect about our own experiences. I mean, it took me, I'm 33 and that situation with my teacher happened when I was 17 and I 
this is like the first time I really talked about it. So it's hard stuff. Like I, I know that. And so go into this with like a lot of compassion and patience for yourself. Um, and this will just help you. The six questions here will help you kind of process and digest what you learned today. Um, your biggest takeaways, your experiencing experiences with body shaming and body image, um, how those are, you know, going into your teaching if they are at all um, and then any changes or growth areas that you want to make um, and then an action step that you want to take in the next week based on all of this um, so yeah check that out it's quick um, and I think it would be best done um, written and so grab a notebook and a pen um, and just keep pen to paper and try to get it all um, out of your mind onto the paper um, Ashley do you think that that's something that would be good to share with your staff and teachers as well and, and ask them to do so that they can take that, that self-reflection journey. Yeah, I absolutely do. I think sharing this video with them um, would be awesome. And then also having, um, there's definitely a couple questions on there that are like specific, like what are your biggest takeaways from this session? Um, but it is also, there's a several questions that are not about what we talked about. Oh, they're about it, but not, you didn't have to watch to do it. So yes, definitely share it with your staff. We have a question in the chat. Ashley, do you do seminars and discussions for dance studio faculty? I do. I do. I do workshops. Um, yeah, I before COVID, I would travel a lot and do um, workshops and seminars. I would do them for um, dancers, dance parents, dance teachers. Um, and now um, with where we are, I'm doing them on Zoom. Um, so yeah, definitely feel free to contact me on the um, hand out the action item is all of my contact information so my email my website my instagram and my phone number um so please reach out if you want to have me i'd love to come awesome so if you're uh, interested in having um, we have a great yeah oh go ahead uh, no sorry we're go finish what you were saying because i want everybody to hear how to contact her oh yes um so uh okay good well then i'll skip that um so definitely do the reflection that we provided in the in the chat uh, on Facebook Live, as well as in Zoom, um, as well as um, Beyond the Steps, the Beyond the Steps 2020 initiative um, that you can find on the ApollaPerformance.com uh, website has a nutrition model, uh, module, excuse me, a nutrition module in it. Um, so that's another uh, free action step that you can take between now and next week to actually complete that nutrition module. And who's that by, Bree? Do you so, uh, uh, Dr. Kristen Kosmikin is, is providing that module, but the whole the whole thing is free. So we encourage everybody to take the entire, I'm gonna pop the link in the chat right now, um, but we encourage everybody to take this because it is free professional development, whether you're a studio owner, educator, um, you know, dancer, parent of a dancer, it's gonna tackle topics like racism, uh, gender equity, uh, diversity, sex abuse and prevention, dance science, nutrition, integrative dance, it's gonna tackle a lot of really important topics that have been uh, the, the, the modules have been provided by experts in the field and so this is all Paul is hosting it we're incurring the, the cost of hosting it on on the platform but it's 100% free so there is no reason not to do it um, and you can go at your own pace and it's just extremely um, insightful so again I am putting that in the chat right now and uh, you can if you're on Instagram joining us you can click the link in our bio um, to it'll take you right to there um, and then obviously I'm putting it in the chat here on zoom um, but it's uh -huh. fantastic so it's definitely awesome. check that out I do sorry go ahead no go ahead Bree. Before we leave, I do have a, 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 a comment from Dancer360 on Instagram. Queuing, it's a great point. Queuing from teachers is an actionable step, um, i.e. not sucking your tummies, but engage your core. So, you know, that's a fabulous point. It's just the way we say things that we've never even thought about, sucking your tummies, that is sending a message, right? Um, so changing our verbiage and being hyper aware of of the, the visuals and the cues and the verb that we're giving our students is is really important and really taking a hard look in it and maybe there's some things that we need to change there as well I also am dropping in the chat um, if you want this episode emailed to you um, and you registered through zoom um, then you answered that question that said um, 
uh, uh, do you want this episode emailed to you, then you're going to get uh, uh, the email of this episode that you can share with your teachers. I'm also going to drop that um, in the chat here in Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook Live right now and you want these episodes emailed to you after the show, then register with us on Zoom. Uh, I'll pop that link in here um, and then you will get this the every episode, but this episode also emailed to you to share with teachers. Um, so I want to recap our, our actionable items are we are going to start if you're a dance educator, a studio owner, you are going to start um, talking to your costume companies, the reps, the, the people who are in charge of costuming and giving us our choices for the season. When you have the opportunity to have that conversation with your rep and or with the company itself, you do it and make sure you give them the feedback that you want more options for more body types and diversity, things that are, are comfortable for everyone. Um, we're going to take a do Ashley's self-reflection worksheet that she generously provided. The link is in the chat. Um, if you register for Zoom, you will get that email to you as well. Um, and uh, you're going to really go through and make sure you're having an honest conversation and you write those thoughts down and see where you can start and make changes in yourself because when we know better, we do better. And then um, thirdly, you're going to hop on over and take the Steps 2020 Initiative course. It's a four-part virtual course series that you can take for free. It's going to tackle a lot of the topics that we talk about here every week on Beyond the Steps. And again, uh, that link is here in the chat or you can go to the Apollo website and start it that way. Um, we hope this was helpful. I feel like we could sit here and talk for hours about this topic. It's been, um, we're grateful for all of you that were able to watch today on Instagram. Hello, uh, Facebook. Hi, thank you. And everybody here on Zoom, thank you for joining. Um, uh, the, the full episode will be available on Apollo's IGTV. That's at Apollo Performance. Um, and you can check out every episode. So there going forward. Um, thank you to Ashley Mowry uh, for, for sharing your story and being so brave and courageous with that. Um, you can follow Ashley on Instagram at Ashley.Mowry, M-O-W-R-E-Y dot mindset and Facebook at Ashley Mowry. Um, and through her website, AshleyMowry.com, she does do studio consults and work with uh, you know faculty and studio owners and dancers. So she is definitely a great resource for this topic if you want to go deeper into this with your with your studio and as always thank you to my friend melissa mcdaniel join melissa and me next week friday october 16th at 2 p.m eastern that is the time 2 p.m eastern every friday as we chat with leslie scott zanovich the founder of ypad and dr tomi ann roberts and we're going to explore the question does hypersexualization exist in dance Hint, yes, it does, um, but we are going to talk about it, and we're going to dive into how it exists and why. Until then, we hope you continue your journey beyond the steps, and everybody have a great weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks Bye for having me. Facebook. Bye, Instagram. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Instagram. <laughs>